Hi everyone, how's this going team here? I've lately been a bit under weather, so uh, instead of doing uh, my usual weekly live stream, I decided to go with um, another off topic. This time around, I want to talk about hiring process and the whole discussion has been started by the tweet from um, David Hansen, who's a creator of Ruby on Rails and founder and CEO of Basecamp, as well as the author of a couple of really good books, uh, Rework and Remote specifically. If you haven't read them, I highly recommend that you go ahead and look them up. They are uh, very informative and very interesting to read. So this is the tweet on right now on the screen and um, I'm just going to read it for you. Hello, my name is David. I would fail to write bubble sort on a whiteboard. I look up code on the internet all the time. I don't do riddles. So the whole discussion is around the fact that most of the companies, uh, whenever they interview, whenever they hire the programmers, they actually do either whiteboard uh, algorithm quizzes or some synthetic programming exercises that have zero relevance to real life, but test your knowledge of specific algorithms, like, you know, building an elevator or counting some, I, I don't even know, like, I, I, I hate those, to be honest. Um, so the thing is that tweet from um, David Hansen actually kicked off a bunch of people to speak up about their experiences of software development. And I'm going to quote some tweets here and then talk a bit about what I think are problems here and how I think they should be tackled and how we tackle them in the university and is specifically in the research group where I work. So uh, here's, for example, uh, Mike Takimovich, who is working as a Google developer expert. I believe this is what it is and a lead at New York Times. And he doesn't know what NP complete means, which is as it seems, you know, working absolutely fine. New York Times has a very great website and they have a lot of very cool uh, stuff going on there. Here is Malte Ubel. I hope I don't butcher the last name of the person and first name as well. So I'm not exactly sure if I correctly read that, but the idea is that Malte worked six years at Google and had to code three advanced algorithms. And he looked all of them on Wikipedia because normally when you work on algorithms, you don't want to invent anything. You want to have a proper test out, you know, verified algorithms and, you know, what the best way is to just go and look up them on Wikipedia, scientific papers, whatever. You don't come up with them yourselves unless there's no analogs, which is uh, kind of impossible in this time and age. Here's Jake Archibald, the guy who helps to develop and design a bunch of APIs. And as he says, he constantly looks them up on Mozilla Developer Network because, you know, you, you don't need to remember all the stuff. Uh, here's Sean Larkin. He is a maintainer of Webpack and he never set up hot replacement module uh, without a boilerplate. I can tell you why. I mean, you've seen me set up hot replacement, uh, hot module replacement with Webpack. It's not easy. That's why you don't remember all that stuff. Here's James Kyle. I mean, you probably know James Kyle. He is a uh, regional maintainer, one of the original maintainers of the Babel, and he never remembers how to set up Babel's runtime library because it's not easy. Once again, you don't need to remember that. You can always look it up. Here's Magnar Svein. I'm okay. I won't read that last name. I don't know how to read it. So here's Magnar. <laughs> He's been doing DevOps works for years, and he always Google's for how to redirect uh, standard error to standard out. I, by the way, do that as well because I that ampersand bracket thing is confusing. I never remember that stuff. <laughs> here's Ivan Morgillo or Morgillo, I guess. Um, uh, he had his share of whiteboard solving algorithms, RB trees at university, and he never needed it for real work in 10 years. And here we come to the point. Most of the developers that actually work on common things, like 90% of the software development, I'll put it this way, you know, enterprise, all that kind of stuff, they don't really need to know all of this. Um, and the another point is that knowing the solutions to whiteboard or to those quizzes, puzzles, sorting algorithms, whatever, you know, doesn't actually mean that you know how to develop a software. I have a couple of friends who we studied together with in the university and, you know, we did these computer science courses together and they were kind of good at them. But now they work as managers, sales, marketing, like whatever, non-computer science related jobs. But I'm pretty sure there's still like some of them were that smart that they probably still remember all those algorithms. And if you put them in front of a whiteboard, they would actually write you bubble sort or, you know, quick sort or whatever. But if you put them in front of a computer and tell them, hey, you have to build this software in two weeks, they wouldn't know what to do because they never built any software. They only know those algorithms because they had them in their curriculum, which is kind of ridiculous. Um, 
And the idea here is that, you know, the people who know how to answer those whiteboard things, they only know it because they somehow prepared for it. And in my opinion, spending, like there was a story about the guy who wanted a job at Google really hard. So he spent half a year just preparing for those interviews. In my opinion, that's a huge waste of time. I mean, imagine how much could you study in half a year while not doing a ridiculously useless whiteboarding. Like it might be helpful in some cases, but unless you're gonna end up working in some algorithm heavy area, like say machine learning or I, I don't know, data compression or something along those lines, those are useless. Like again, I've been, software, I've been developing software professionally for more than 12 years, I guess. And then if you take like five or six more years, where I was just like digging around myself and programming stuff that I didn't quite understood, I never needed any of those. Uh, and there, there's actually um, a reason for that because, you know, if you are actually working on uh, normal tasks, all of those alg algorithms are already implemented in uh, either in standard libraries or in third party libraries that are produced by universities. Here's the thing. If you want to code algorithm yourself, in 99.9% .9 of cases, you will never beat the people who sit at the university or at Google or wherever the programming language was made you almost never will be able to build an implementation of the algorithm that will be beating that implementation of the you know, academic who did that or of the person on a salary in Google who spent like two years optimizing it. No freaking way you're gonna do that. And this is the thing, it's, it's most of the time it's absolutely useless. You don't have to do that. You don't have to optimize it. You don't have to think about it. You can just take the implementation and use it in your code to build something that actually has meaning. And, um, you know, then there are all those minor problems, let's put it this way. So for example, if you take me, I had to do my share of um, like interviews basically for working, right? And uh, one of the big problems that I personally encountered, I'm not a native English speaker, right? And I did my uh, diploma in Russian. So when I um, did all the math, math and um, statistics and I don't know, whatever, algorithmics, computer science classes, we had all the terminology, everything was in Russian. So whenever a person in the uh, a job interview or whatever, even like in academia sometimes, asks me some question about the terms that I don't know in English, I get completely lost. I need like a day to just go on Wikipedia and see the translation and, you know, figure out what the hell is this talking about. It's like, if I know that thing in Russian doesn't actually mean that I can easily answer and talk about it in English because I don't know the terminology. It's like, I never did that stuff in English. So unless I specifically work on something related, I will have zero idea about that, you know, and that that's a problem for me. And uh, another like issue, so this is a, example from uh, my interview with Google, for example, they offered me a position there, uh, or rather, rather they w was interesting in hiring me, let's put it this way. And uh, at some point they was like, okay, let's do an interview. And I was asking like, okay, so what do you guys have for me in mind? Because they contacted me through my academic email. So, you know, they must have saw my academic work and thought I would be fitting somewhere. And the recruiter was like, yeah, we have this like five position in five completely different and unrelated areas. And we're going to do a whiteboard interview. So I was like, nope, thank you. I just like, I, you don't even know where you want to hire me. And you're already like giving me arbitrary whiteboard puzzles. I'm not interested in that. <laughs> this, this is the most ridiculous part about it. Uh, I think the quote that is um, usually attributed to, I think Albert Einstein is the most fitting here. It's like, you don't actually have to remember everything. You just know where to find it, right? So I think this is the brilliant quote, especially for software developers, because if you know how to properly Google, you can actually solve 90, I don't know, 99% of problems, 98 maybe. There are some problems that actually are not in Google, sadly, or maybe not yet. Maybe you will be the one who will write an article about that, who will publish a paper about that. But most of the common issues, even architectural, even, you know, the very specific ones like big data load balancing and all that kind of stuff, you can Google them. We just like, we just shipped a big data benchmarking platform that we built from scratch here in our university. And most of the stuff that we use there, it is in Google. If you just go up ahead and if you know how to properly search, you can find the solution. 
Sure, it won't be the complete one, you know, you will have to use different bits and pieces, but once you find them all, you can actually just compose it in one platform that works. I, I sure hope it works. We'll see, see how the tests hold up, but I think it should be fine. And it gets, um, you know, the, the fact, the way that the uh, interviewing right now works, it goes to ridiculous extent. So, for example, there's a tweet from Max Howell, um, uh, you might know him as MXEL. He is actually a developer of Homebrew. Uh, this is the package manager for macOS, if you don't know it. And basically, if you're using Mac and if you're using macOS, Homebrew is the basically the only way to maintain your command line and not just command line tools. So, for example, my uh, my Node.js is installed over Brew. I have like Android SDK installed over Brew, Golang, uh, LastPass, Kubernetes, whatever. All of that stuff is here in Homebrew. So it's a very nice package manager. And basically any people who use macOS and who develop on it, they use Homebrew. Uh, he was invited to an interview in Google and they offered him to do to invert a binary tree on a whiteboard as you can see here and he couldn't do it because well why the hell would you be able to do that if you don't do it daily and i'm sure nobody does and uh they said that you know he's not good enough for them but 90 percent of the google engineers use his software this is ridiculous if anything and i mean this was like what two years ago almost but still that's that doesn't nothing really changed over those two years these procedures are still just as stupid as ever um, I've seen there is a, actually a discussion on this topic in Hacker News, and I just want to point uh, two interesting comments on that. So first one is uh, from the guy with the username Pavlov, uh, which is quite, um, you know, right username, let's put it this way. So uh, he compares um, the whiteboard interviews to the classic British private schools that force boys to memorize long passages of ancient Greek and Latin texts. The idea is that this is done not to check your um, not to check your level, you know, not to assess your ability to actually code something, but to assess your um, actually ability to fit in, to see if you will be willing to go to any extent to actually fit into the corporation, to accept the culture, and you know, to do stuff like this, which is completely ridiculous. And he basically says here that you know, same hiring results. Uh, can be achieved by replacing the crack in the code interview with Ovid's uh, metamorphosis, which, I mean, actually, he's not wrong. <laughs> this, this is like, yeah, th this will totally work. It's like cultural fit thing. It's, it it's still, still remains ridiculous. And uh, there, uh, this uh, Hacker News thread has some very interesting thoughts in there. And um, this is one of them. I just want to see, you know, wanna, I wanted to hear what the people with more experience say, like someone who had been coding for 20, 30 years. And most of them say pretty much the same. Uh, so here's the guy, Clay M, who's saying that he's been paid to work, uh, to write code for 20 years or so. And he can't remember any of the algorithms. Because as I said, normally you don't need to remember any of that. There are standard libraries that work way better than you could have ever implemented them. And being in, able to understand the problem is actually enough to successfully Google. That's what I was saying, right? So, and this is the most valuable skill for a programmer. And again, I think this is the like thought of the I don't know of the century, I guess, unless they will invent something better than Google for that. But actually, Googling is the most valuable skill you can ever have, and it's not just software engineering that is. Um, basically uh, valuable for, but I guess, you know, most of the jobs that uh, share the experience online. Uh, there's just as a throw in, there's a additional very interesting site called rejected.us. Um, that is, they rejected us. Uh, it's hosted on GitHub and it, it contains a collection of tweets and messages from people who were rejected from large corporations for different stupid reasons. And that includes actually the Max Howell, that includes Carl Simpson, author of the Udo New GS, who was rejected because they think he didn't know enough GS, which is like, you know, if you think about it, this is completely ridiculous because I think Udo New GS is one of the best books about JavaScript. And there is, you know, there's a bunch of very like good and famous developers in here and they all have been rejected from large corporations for stupid reasons because they, you know, they couldn't do something on a whiteboard or among those lines. I will put those links in the video, by the way, so you can go ahead and look at them yourselves and the description, uh, the link for the Hacker News conversation. So before, um, let me just, I guess, uh, close the Chrome for now. Before, um, 
before I wrap the video up, I just want to talk a bit about the possible solutions and, and tell you what we actually do in our research group uh, to tackle this problem, right? So um, I think that actually just talking to a person about technologies is more valuable than seeing how he tackles tests on a whiteboard. So when you start talking about Node.js, about the latest frameworks, Express, ES6 features, upcoming JavaScript feature, WebAssembly, whatever, you know right away if person knows anything about that, right? So and if, if you interview him, for example, for a JavaScript position, this is what you want to talk about. Um, again, this obviously won't give you the full picture, but it doesn't really need to because this is an interview, you get a feel for the candidate and you know, you most likely you will see if you will work with him normally or not. And uh, obviously it's good. So like this is one of the most controversial points, I guess. Like one of the best indicators of the level of the programmer is his open source projects. But as a lot of people know that, you know, if you work eight, five, and you have kids, you have wife, you have personal life, basically hobbies, whatever, and you don't code on the weekends, you might not have those open source projects. And if you, again, if your work is like all closed source and you cannot really show anything, that's a problem. And that's still fine. You know, if you don't have them, that is not something that should punish you during the interview. You say, okay, you know, I work eight, five, I don't have them. It's fine. It's okay. Nobody, nobody should be punished for that because this is stupid as well. So, um, Another thing that is actually we usually do is if if there is desire in the candidate, if we don't really sure if we should hire, hire him or you know if he fits completely or not, if he has the skills, is that we give him our real project and a real task and ask him to finish it. Just some small ticket on a GitHub, some small issue that you know we know that it will take like one hour, two hours maximum, and see how he actually did it. That is usually enough, more than enough to actually see if the person is capable of the task we want him to do. And um, more than that, then usually if the resume is good, we offer a trial period. And I think this is a very like nice practice. I think that is possibly, I, I mean, it should be possible all around the world, right? Because it's like, the, I know that Germany, for example, has a very strict employment policies, unless your contract says that you can be terminated at any moment, which is, I don't think is even possible. You, like you're basically protected from that. Yeah, but if you have a trial period, you can be just terminated at any point and say, hey, you didn't manage it. So what we do is we offer a short trial period, usually up to three months paid trial period. So the person knows that we actually value his time where we give him some small project, not as small as, you know, one ticket to close in the evening, but something more significant to see how he will fare with it. Like write an additional, I don't know, knowledge extraction module for one of our uh, tools or something along those lines, basically, or improve the uh, speed of our indexing algorithms or something like this. But again, talking about algorithms, there's our research group specialty so you can really run away from that and um yeah that, that's a different question so yeah this is sort of my thoughts on um general hiring process let me know what you think it comments let me know what you went through i will be very curious to hear what kind of uh, interview experiences you had uh, and uh, let me know if you think you disagree with me on any of those points. I will be happy to discuss with you. Come on to our new Discord server and let's talk over there. So thank you for watching and I guess see you next week. Hopefully I will feel myself better so we can actually finish the deployment part and finally deploy our complete platform. Thank you for watching and I see you next time. Bye.